Hi, this is Dave Seaman, and you're listening to the House Culture Podcast. House Culture. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode in our fourth season of the House Culture Podcast, hosted as ever by me, the managing editor at House Culture, Matt Rouse. As I said on the season opening episode last time around, I'm thrilled to be back behind this mic talking to you guys and I'd like to say hi to everyone tuning back in and to those newbies who might not have listened before. If you fall into that latter category, we are House Culture, a collective of house music fans who have come together through their mutual love of the beat to celebrate the spirit of house music. Come follow us on our Instagram feed at housecultureNet you can hook up with over 100,000 other beat lovers from across the planet. And don't forget to have a flick through our back catalogue of episodes as we always make sure our guests are interesting and have a fascinating story to tell. Whether it's hearing from legends like David Morales talking about making iconic anthems, behind the scenes scenesters like Pikes Hotel creative director Dawn Hindle discuss the goings on at a Beaton institution, or you want to hear from leaders of the new school like Josh Butler, Andrea Oliva or the Picard brothers, we have got you covered. Now, let's get on with this next episode. In this one, I spoke to a former editor of Mixmag, a brother in rhythm, a label boss of arguably some of the greatest imprints from within our scene, someone who is synonymous with huge clubbing brands like Renaissance and Global Underground. It can only be the one and only Dave Seaman. In our chat, you'll hear how he was in exactly the right place at the right time. Well, house music arrived and that turned everything on its head. And I was very, very lucky to get a job at Mixmag in 1987. And 1987 was the year that DJ culture really started to become a thing. The kind of era that he oversaw as editor of an industry bible. The real glory years of Acid House. I was editor through the second summer of love. It was the most magical of times. How after over three decades in the game, technology has helped him grow as a DJ and artist. As technology developed, rather than it being like one record into the next one, you could start having layer upon layer and it could become like this really quite creative audio collage, a real piece of art. The idea of mixing became something way, way, way more than just going from one record to the next. And why music will always play a huge part in his life. Music is the healing force, isn't it? It's the language that we all speak, no matter where we come from, and can bring everybody together and do so much. So yeah, we'll we'll always be there. One of the the main things in in my life, for sure. I hope you enjoy this one. This is Dave Seaman. House Culture. Hi Dave, it's a pleasure to have you on the House Culture podcast today. Thanks so much for sitting down with us. You're a titan of dance music, someone who has been the editor of an industry bible, a DJ that has played for all the major clubbing institutions around the world, a producer and remixer that has worked with genuine top tier talent such as Kylie Minogue and the Pet Shop Boys, and a label head that's presided over the release of some genuine anthems of our scene. When you put it all together like that, how does that make you feel? Yeah, well, it's been 30 years, so I've got to put a few things in there, haven't I? <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Um, Before we come on to delving deep into all of that, uh, we always like to go back and start at the beginning with all of our guests. Um, can you tell us about growing up in Leeds and how you first got into music there when you were young? Um, I started just uh, collecting records, really. Um, um, I wasn't playing an instrument as such, but I loved music. Um, so I just was listening to the radio a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, but remember, radio back then wasn't even FM. It was, you know, it was medium wave. So when you listen to the radio, it was pretty you know, it was in mono, it's bad quality. Yeah. You know, you, you look, you got a good reception with that hissing, hissing and crackling and, and all that kind of thing. Um, so when you um, got a record and you put it on a on a turntable at home, your home stereo system, and you listen to this, this piece of music in stereo, it was like another world. Mm-hmm. So that experience, I think, was uh, really exciting. Um, so, yeah, I just started collecting records from about seven or eight, probably, mm-hmm. you know, picking up 
bits from various members of the family and and it was just yeah got got a bit obsessed with it he sort of um he spent all my pocket money on records and and then that that sort of naturally became a thing about djing then really because obviously mm-hmm. people that had lots of records played them to people yeah. um and you know uh, birthday parties or weddings or um when we were away on holiday that's when i um you know, saw saw these people playing these records to people and everybody having a fantastic time, uh, which was uh, addictive. Yeah. Um, and um, I wanted to, I, you know, I wanted to do that. So this is from a very, very early age, eight, nine or something, way before DJing was anything like it is now. <laughs> you know, the, the biggest thing you could hope for back then was a, a gig in the, the local nightclub on a Friday night. And that was about it. You know, the thought of traveling around the world, doing it to thousands of people. Yeah. All looking at you, by the way, that was a big change for DJ. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when everybody turned to face the DJ in the late 80s, um, uh, as opposed to, you know, these weddings and stuff, people, you know, you were just the person in the corner yeah. providing the service of uh, playing the music. It wasn't, you weren't the focus really. So, yeah, so that, that's that's how I kind, of, I kind of got into it. It was a, the local youth club at school, actually, mm-hmm. school disco. I used to, you know go and watch the the guy who was doing it every tuesday at the, at the junior junior youth club junior school disco yeah and one week he was ill um and the guy who ran the youth club said well you've got some records well, why don't you do it for a bit you know what you're doing you've been watching him for the last few weeks so um <laughs> i kind of yeah okay uh, and that was it i that was i was only uh, 12 i think 13 wow wow and you got the bug just then i mean it's yeah to, to be collecting records at that kind of young age as well it shows a, and like and you say at that point there wasn't like a pursuit of fame or anything like that it was just a case of you love this and you want to bring it to share this passion with more and more people i mean at that mm. time was there any before that first kind of gig even at that youth club i suppose were you collecting any particular type of genre when you look back did you have a particular avenue that were you focusing down or was it just everything no pop music yeah mm-hmm. pop music music that was in the charts um this you know uh Again, we're talking about late seventies, early eighties, around that time now, and and um, yes, of course, there was genres um, going on. Um, there was lots of things. Nineteen seventy nine, eighty, around that time, early eighties was crazy for all the different tribes, all different things going on, post punk, new romanticism. Um, uh, you know, there's loads of stuff, but I was only picking up the stuff that was going into the charts and it was, you know, the best of it, best of all the genres were going, it was going into the charts. Yeah. The charts was very, very varied in, in, in its um, style in style. So, so yeah, I was picking the, the best of the best of each genre, really the ones that was uh, making the, um, you know, making the pop charts. Yeah. Yeah. And, and do you remember that first gig that, 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 that big break, even before you were a teenager, how it went down, what it felt like, what you were playing with the reactions? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, back then, you know, when you were doing, it was a very good apprenticeship to, to play to uh, people's weddings or at the youth club or whatever, because as, as I just alluded to then, there's lots of tribes um, mm-hmm. around that time. It's not so much the case anymore. I don't really see teenagers today. Uh, um, they kind of, you know, like, like a bit of everything, but they don't have to put themselves into one camp. You know, back yeah. then I had to play a little bit of goth. I had to play a little bit of heavy metal. I had to play a little bit of the jam. Mm-hmm. I had to play a little bit of David Bowie. I had to play a little bit of, you know, uh, go on, on and on and on. There was a bit of rock and roll. You're talking weddings, a bit of rock yeah. and roll for the you know, older people. People, uh-huh. uh, Northern Soul, um, you know, and I had to have a little bit of everything of all those different kind of genres, and you had to cater to everybody. Mm-hmm. Everybody, it's, I remember the youth club was, you know, it was a case of everybody, you know, was waited for their little moment when you was going to play a couple of jam records, and all the jam fans came on, and and then play a couple of heavy metal records, and then all they came on, and then they all went back off to the side again. So yeah, it was it was um, quite eclectic. Yeah. It was a good good way to try to keep as many people happy as possible. I said no. Um, which is a good a good motto to 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 you know to still have in the yeah. in the back of your mind these days. Um, and it was a good good way to keep abreast of all different kinds of music. You know, all the best of the the best of all genres, as I said before. Yeah, uh, the yeah. ones that tended yeah. to make the pop charts, the ones that were the most popular in each genre, was a good place to um, you know to start your um, education on each uh, each each genre, each style of music. Yeah, yeah, a real fertile ground. I was going to use the word education. Yeah, it's just to be able to pick up all of those genres and, and you know and know what works within each one of those ones. It's a you know it's a real feather in your cap. I mean, so you're at the youth club and you played on these decks. I mean, you had a record player at home, obviously. What was the step up in terms of buying some more equipment or anything like that? You know, was it a case of okay, you've seen the equipment that this guy in the youth club's got? I need to have that, or how did? 
those first set of decks come about? Well, yeah. I mean, again, we're talking <laughs> we're talking about one of these mobile you know, double the double deck units, the file double decks that I had to, yeah. to go and do various because I, I it, um, it kind of escalated quite quickly for me in my local area, and I ended up doing lots of people's birthday parties and lots of restaurants, and I was doing you know by the time I was 15, 16, I was doing lots of pubs in the in the in my in my local village two or three nights a week and mm -hmm. um so yeah so i had to have mobile equipment um this is uh, i didn't i didn't have a pair of techniques that was, was too um too advanced for the time yeah uh, and this is pretty house music really you know we're mm -hmm. talking 87 was when i um moved down to london and started working for mixmag which i'm sure we'll get onto in a minute um mm. that's when really dance music house music exploded and the art of mixing i was aware of the art of mixing um i used to devour Record Mirror was the magazine at the time mm -hmm. that used to have a DJ column in it um, that written by James Hamilton. So I used to devour that every week and, and you know, used to, you know, be um, aware of club music and DJs in clubs and stuff. But that wasn't what I was doing. I was trying to, as I say, cater for, you know, everybody from Smith's fans to, um, you know, to, to the goths who wanted a bit of Cure or whatever, yeah. Sisters of Mercy or whatever. <laughs> so, um so yeah, so it was just a, a mobile rig that I I um, got. I think um, my fourteen, I was would have been fourteen or maybe maybe fourteen. I think uh, Christmas, I got my my parents bought me a, a set of double decks, fal double decks, um, and I had all the, the mobile lighting and 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 you know um, rope light and, and yeah, <laughs> yeah. A little scoop, all that kind of thing. And used to take that round with me. Yeah, so um, so these were belt driven. These weren't even. Mm. Um, you know, direct drive like techniques are, so you, you couldn't really mix on them. Yeah. But, um, I, I try my best. It was a good. <laughs> um, and, and if you can really, you know, get hard, get 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 even the tiniest bit of a hang on it on, on belt driven turntables, then it stands you in good stead for for when you're on to the to the uh, proper stuff. Oh, it's like God. learning to drive in a clapped out, you know, clap, clap, clapped out Fiesta, and then getting into a Rolls Royce. <laughs> and at that stage, did we, you know, you were teaching all of this yourself. Um, there weren't any like mentors or anything like that. You were just kind of going by your own groove and vibe and just checking out what's happening on the dance floor. Again, I mean, it's hard to to really kind of put into words, um, you know, the difference of, of that era, that mm. time to what we have now. I mm. mean, I didn't have access to any kind of dance music, really. Um, there was no radio, no dance music on the radio. Mm -hmm. I didn't have any radio shows. There's no, of course, no internet. You know, my, my thirst for wanting to learn about DJing was limited to one, two pages in a magazine once a week, you know, which I probably read four or five times every week <laughs> again and again, because that's all the access I had or go, or maybe, a, you know, the senior youth club uh, on a Friday night, which eventually I gravitated to, but they had a, another DJ came in and did that. It was a professional mobile DJ. Mm -hmm. And so I used to see him and watch him. I, d I wasn't old enough to go to clubs. Yeah. I wasn't, I had no access no top of the pops on a thursday night on it you know was the the pop music program on the tv every week that mm -hmm. everybody used to watch and i had radio one which just played you know music from the charts that was it i don't uh, so i didn't have any any access to any mentors <laughs> there's <laughs> youtube videos that i could watch forever and ever i mean now you know you literally could you know find youtube videos about the most niche thing and probably find enough videos to keep you going for a week <laughs> yeah yeah go down uh, the, go down that rabbit hole yeah, but no, none of that, none of that. So no. yeah, so you're kind of making it up as you go along, really. Um, yeah. I mean, I used to hang out in record shops. That was another good, good mm -hmm. place to gather experience and knowledge, and and um, used to you know do a lot of vinyl collecting and, and just just trying learning stuff from uh, from other people that were into into music at the time. Cool. And uh, so, what would you say would was your kind of big break or almost the point where? Maybe did you think oh, I could do this as a career or, you know, this is what I want to do with my life or what what kind of happened there? Uh, well, house music arrived, didn't it? <laughs> and that kind of turned everything on its head. Um, and I was very, very lucky to get a job at Mixmag in mm. 1987. Um, 1987. <laughs> First house music kind of arrived into the UK via... Uh, things like Marshall Jefferson's movie Body, um, Jackie Body, Steve Silk Curly, mm -hmm. some of these Chicago records arriving from Chicago that went into the charts, went to number one. Jack, Jackie Body went in at number one, you know, so it yeah. came with a, with a bit of a, um, with impact. <laughs> it was like, yeah. wow, what is, what is this music? Um, and 1987 was the year that um, the DJ culture really started to 
become a thing. Um, the advent of technology of samplers um, became available. Um, and so DJs that were club DJs that worked in clubs that had the ideas that of what kind of music worked on a dance floor, but had never previously had the, the equipment or the studios or, or, um, or the ability really to make their own music. If they weren't classic, you know, if they weren't a trained musician and, you know, it's very expensive to go in studios back then. So you're able to suddenly do this at home, you know, like on a basic computer and a sampler or in a very basic, um, you know, keyboard and a very basic studio. Um, it it democratised music to a certain extent. Um, and all of 1987, you had Cold Cup, Mars, S Express, Bomb the Bass, mm-hmm. all making sample records. These were records that, again, came, felt like they came from out of space from yeah. <laughs> you know, like these this was some so something was a was a foot you know mm-hmm. um uh there was a definite change the dj wasn't just as i said this guy in the background in the corner there who was just supplying a service he, he became a focal point for the night you know almost like um like you would go and watch a band yeah. uh, a concert you know it was mm-hmm. that kind of turning point and i was very lucky to uh, uh find get myself a job at mix mag um, yeah. which at the time was D- D- Mix Mag was owned by DMC, which were the, who were the people that did the mixing, scratching championships, DJ championships. Um, they also owned Mix Mag. They also had studios and were doing exclusive remixes mm-hmm. for DJs only, not for sale. You had to; it was a subscription only service. You had to pay your subscription every month, and they sent you these exclusive remixes that nobody else could get, uh, along with a copy of the magazine. Mm-hmm. It was a very industry based thing, and they were the only people doing it. This again was pre remixes weren't even really a thing back yeah. in the until until around this time. Um, they were really drove the whole idea of of, of making different versions to play in nightclubs that other pe- that people haven't heard on the radio mm-hmm. something new something different extending you know various sections to make it better for a, in a, a nightclub environment yeah so um so yeah i was a member uh, again i was this was another thing that uh, a way of me trying to l- learn stuff about djing uh-huh. i joined up with uh, the uh, you know the dj organization that sent me a magazine every month some exclusive records and they i went to the 1980 87 convention uh, mm-hmm. in london mm-hmm. uh, it was where the, they get the dmc awards away and yeah and did the mixing and scratching championships and i am um, i there was a, a raffle a grand raffle um sponsored by camel cigarettes if you took a cigarette <laughs> off the, the promo girl uh you could fill, fill your name and address it in the hat and you know you went into the grand raffle and um i came out of the hat first and, yeah. and won week in new york um wow. at the new music seminar which at the, the new music seminar at the time was sort of the equivalent of what the miami music week is now the winter music yeah. conference you know um, it's an industry gathering or the ade in, in amsterdam you know mm-hmm. is an industry gathering it was the only one of its kind really where people from the industry all went and gathered in new york for a week and yeah. and you know got ideas and did business deals and went clubbing and just generally um hung, hung out and partied yeah um and how old were you when you won that i was 19 wow so i wasn't even old enough to get into clubs in, in america at the time <laughs> but i went uh, i thought it was a hoax i really did i thought somebody was winding me up but i did i won i won the week in new york i went out to new york for the week uh-huh. i got to hang out with a lot of people from the uk record industry you know big people in in dance music at the time the people from dmc you know some of the big djs from the radio uh, were, were there and, and you know i was a kid in a sweet shop i mean i was in i'd become obsessed with as i said trying to gather information about djing and nightclubs through my teenage years and all yeah. of a sudden i was in the center new york at the time through the 80s was the the best place in the world for nightclubs and nightclubbing yeah. and yeah. i was in right in the eye of the storm all of a sudden so um what so what clubbing experiences did you have out there you, like you said you were too young to get into any clubs did you manage to to get in and see anything or yeah I mean, yeah because i was i mean i was very young looking anyway but because i had an industry pass and and i was with some other you know big people from the industry i got into a few places i went to mars i remember was one one particular one um which we really enjoyed with mark Kamins, and then uh, yeah i went to a few other other places um but the the, the way I, I got my job at mixmag uh, was 
I'd been I'd been in New York all week with everybody on the final day. I went out shopping, went out record shopping, went out clothes shopping, you know, just again, just trying to take in everything I possibly could of being in New York for my final few hours. And then on the final day, I went uh, I don't have to be running around New York for the day. I went we were staying at uh, in Times on Times Square at the Marriott Marquis, which is where the, the convention was being held. Mm-hmm. And I stopped at McDonald's um, just opposite on Times Square to grow, to get some food. I was starving as I and as I went back to the hotel, every Everybody, you know, from the group that we had kind of, um, you know, was hanging out with all week from DMC, DMC were all in reception. They were all um, sort of about to go out for dinner and they said, oh, do you want to come with us and our, um, for, for some food? Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, I've just eaten. I've just had my, my McDonald's. So what are you, what are your plans for later? Are you going to do anything later? And, and they said, oh, yeah, um, we're um, we're going to go to Nell's, you know, if you want to come. And I said, oh, OK, all right, fine. I'll, I'll see you there and, and walked off. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> I found out later they all kind of went, all right okay yeah all right you know he was just walking off thinking he's going to get into Nell's he's 19 and yeah. I didn't realize at all but Nell's at the time was one of the hardest most exclusive clubs to get into in New York mm-hmm. but I just met the guy who worked on the door at Nell's in the queue at McDonald's <laughs> he'd seen my pass and said oh you're here for the convention you know where you're from blah blah yeah. blah I got chatting he said oh you should come to my club come to Nell's here's my card I thought nothing of it. I put it in my car, in my pocket, thought, oh, well, I'm never not going to do that. And then, of course, when they said it, I said, oh, I'll see you there. Amazing. I went to Nell's that night. I got in and went had a few drinks. And um, and a couple of hours later, I was with somebody else that had won the competition as well. Um, and a couple of hours after we'd been there, there was, you know, it was the last night. It was getting late. I knew we had to fly back the next day. And, and um, there was no sign of anybody. I thought, oh, they're not going to they're not going to come. So uh, so I left, left the club and, and there they all were on the pavement outside the club. They couldn't get in. <laughs> <laughs> So I had a, at that point I'd had a few drinks and I was like, oh, no, come, come, come on, come, here's my friend Michael on the door. Come, like, These are all my friends from England. Can, 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 oh, he's like, yeah, yeah, come in. So I got all these people into the club um, that they couldn't get into. And I was the the Ike from, from Leeds, 19-year-old Ike from Leeds. So yeah, about two weeks, two weeks after I got back, um, yeah, the, the people who own DMC, Christine, Tony and Christine, ran me up and said, uh, you know, do you, I don't know what we want you to do, but we, we <laughs> obviously if you can get us into a club in New York, um, <laughs> then we think you could, you know, you could fit in here at DMC. You're the kind of people, person that we want here. So um, so I've, I jacked in my job at uh, an advertising agency in Leeds and went uh, went down to to London to be T-boy. And uh, that was, yeah, that was 1987. It was just as the whole thing kicked off. So that, yeah, wow, that was incredible. undoubtedly massive break what a twist of fate and and um yeah right in right into the to the eye of the storm the deep end and that's and nuts that's where it all started. from the queue of mcdonald's to one of the elite yeah. clubs of new york to then i always talk to people like... in the queue at mcdonald's you don't know what you're <laughs> going to get yeah <laughs> when you're at a convention just where you work pass around and uh yeah people notice and it starts a conversation that's incredible and so so the guys over at dmc were like you know we've got to have this guy on our team then obviously you know if you can do that there's something special about him and so what was mix mag like at that time and you i know you worked your way up to and you became editor and you were there for three years i mean like as editor for three years i mean what during that period how did the music change and the actual publication change as well what what kind of era did you see in during your time there well again like like i said was right in the the eye of the storm it was the real glory years of acid house so i i I was i was editor through the 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 second summer of love you know (laughs) 1988 89 when raves around you know took off around the the london orbital and and you know it was it was the most the magical of times. Yeah, it was a brand new youth culture that was exploding, uh, and I was right, right there, you know, mm-hmm. right in the thick of it, living and living it. Um, so yeah, I mean, I started started at DMC and uh, as T boy really, and, and then did a few reviews for the magazine. Just was helping out in the studios, doing a bit of all sorts really, and then the editor left uh, the, uh, the magazine and and. The magazine was, as I say, it was a subscription only. It was a DJ industry only thing. You had to be, a, you had to work in the industry to be able to get it. Um, it wasn't on the, the magazine shelves. But um, as this whole culture was exploding, um, you know, things were really taking off fast. And the idea of the DJ and 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 house music and electronic music and dance music and nightclubs and things were um, the, things were going into the charts and yeah. and um, uh, becoming slowly but surely get, coming into mainstream culture. 
Yeah. So I could so I saw that the magazine had the potential to become a magazine for the public, not just an industry magazine. And and that was the the direction that we took it and we launched it to to the public in in nine in July 1989. Mm-hmm. Um and then I was there for another couple of years after that. Um yeah, yeah, 88, 89, <laughs> 90, 90, 90, 90, 90. Wow. That's um, the birth of it. I mean So so we were making the rules up as we went along. It was a the UK is brilliant it was brilliant at youth culture, you know, exporting youth culture, you know, the I uh, this these tribes that we talked about earlier, you know, um punk and new romanticism and mods and rockers before it and glam rock and and all sorts of stuff that then was exported around the rest of the world well well acid house you know was another um acid house a rave mm-hmm. so I, sometimes i say acid house and people today think oh you mean that music that's got acid in it well yes that was part of it but acid house was was a you know a whole culture a whole movement yeah. it wasn't just a genre of music it was a um and and that whole thing um exploded and i, th- I, sp- I suppose a lot of us at the time thought well there's a f- you know a few years in this like there was for <laughs> punk like there was for new romanticism yeah you know, they you know there's a fashion-led trend that the music was a part of and then the kind of fashion did died and the music kind of died with it a little bit um mm-hmm. but that never really happened with acid house you know electronic music came on and still going today obviously um yeah. it, it was kind of the electronic version of rock and roll it's just keeps getting repackaged for the next generation coming through all the time so yeah, so right yeah to be there at the very beginning of this revolution was uh was uh yeah was very very uh lucky very very privileged <laughs> so i mean in your role as uh, at mix mag um where was it down to you were you actually having to go out and experience these uh, raves and parties and be a dj still as well and like absorb yourself in all of that that scene and and like do that with your team you know what was that kind of era like as you as kind of almost a you know not only an editor of uh, an industry magazine but but a um you know a punter on the dance floor basically you know and experiencing that you know uh, what was that vibe like during in the uk during that time and that birth of that well uh well yeah i stopped djing when i went down to mix mag when i went mm-hmm. down to dmc i mean my dj in sort of you know circuit was all very local around leeds mm-hmm. so I didn't, and i didn't take all my mobile equipment down with me and try <laughs> to start finding gigs out there or anything um you know i was just wanting to be absorbed in in everything that was going on at dmc there was so much going on there and it was so exciting that um i that yeah i was out i was out what going to yeah be the punter like you say on the dance floor i was going mm. to all these raves uh going to i used to go to the hacienda in manchester every weekend used to drive back up from london every weekend and wow. go back to leeds sometimes go to the warehouse in leeds but yeah all these illegal raves that were happening around the m25 and all over the country they were starting to spring up mm-hmm. through, through 1988 really the summer of 88 was very um transform transformative once you know the, the the whole story that i'm sure has been told a million times of, of paul oakenfold nikki holloway and pete tong and, and um coming back from Ibiza at the end of 87 and, and then bringing that back in the sort of winter of 88, it all exploded. And, and yeah. I, yeah, I was, I was there trying to report on all that and go and take in all these DJs doing all this new thing, um, going to um, Spectrum uh, and Land of Oz and, and Shume and, and all these, these things. Um, uh, and the Hacienda and all So, so yeah, I was just trying to, trying to take it all in, trying to report on what was going on, mm-hmm. trying to, be the voice of 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 the scene really that was the idea to be the 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 voice of this this new movement that was going on and and the whole dj as a star as focal point Mm -hmm. um dj culture remix culture all this you know was very much a part of of the the ethos of what dmc was built upon so it was a natural natural progression to to uh to take that to the masses really you know mm-hmm. to um to be the uh to be the the bible as we as we you mentioned before you yeah. know the dance music bible really was a club bible as it really became in the through the 90s absolutely and you know you're you obviously had a stint there and then the next what did you do kind of next i know you know you teamed up with steve anderson and brothers in rhythm and you know you're djing in shelley's around that era as well i mean what how did they happen at the same time? What happened next after Mix Mag? Yeah, it all it all kind of was happening simultaneously. Really, I I started in I moved down October eighty seven, sort of by May eighty eight. I was that's when I think when the editor previous editor left, and I just started to work at the magazine, looking after the magazine, really being editor. Mm. I was kind of standing editor for a few months, and then eventually they just said, well, you carry on, you're doing a good job. So, um, and Steve Anderson, I think, joined late 88, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, So he came in to start working in the studios. I was already working at the magazine. 
And so we kind of, we were the two young kids in the company, really, that had just joined and both living and breathing the new revolution that was going on. Um, although Steve didn't really go clubbing so much, but he was very, very studio orientated and musically orientated. So mm-hmm. was um, really, um, and came from a DJ background. So he was really, really into all, all, all everything that was happening. So, so yeah, he came up, he was coming, you know, DMC was split into with all the offices, mixed bag offices were upstairs and all the studios were downstairs. He would come upstairs and do some writing for the magazine. And I would go downstairs and hang out in the studios on an evening. And, and then, yeah, we ended up doing uh, a remix of Style Council's Promised Land, I think, was the first thing we ever did together yeah. for a DMC only. One of the DMC albums that we were talking about, we did a lot of remixes for, for exclusively for them. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, um, we all of a sudden we, we were brothers in rhythm and we made Peace and Harmony off the back of the Style Council remix and then Such a Good Feeling, mm-hmm. which became went on to become a, a pop hit, you know. Yeah. And, um, um, and, and all of a sudden, Brothers in Rhythm started to explode. And I, this was... 1990, 1991. Um, also, at the same time, um, I the guy who was my photographer, Gary McLaren, and who was one sort of my head main photographer at Mixmag, who we used to I used to go to a lot of the raves, a lot of the clubs with. I used to do the writing report. I used to do, take all the photos. Mm-hmm. He started a club in Stoke called Shelley's. Mm-hmm. Um, because Hacienda closed down for a little while, they were having some some problems with some gangs in Manchester around that time. The Hacienda got closed. So everybody was looking for a new place to go. He said, oh, I've got this club in Stoke. Well, let's get uh, get Sasha to come and play there. Mm-hmm. Sasha only wanted to do three weeks out of every four because he was getting offered some gigs in other parts of the country on a Friday night as well that he wanted to go do too. Mm-hmm. So Gary said to me, do you want to do the other week, the fourth week, and, and maybe do some warm-ups on the other nights when, when Sasha's playing? Um, and uh, that, so that's how I got back into DJing, really, yeah, right. um, and, and and how I got onto t- uh, t- twelve uh, Technics turntables, and <laughs> all of a sudden I was I was actually playing in a club to a to a very very hungry dance floor. Mm. Um, of course, I had access to all the music uh, mm-hmm. from from being at Mixmag. I was getting all you know all the music first because my company was just, was sending me white labels and, mm-hmm. and promos. Um, so that was great. And and at, at DMC, they had Technics turntables as well. So I had a chance to, you know, to actually learn how to properly mix and, and be surrounded by a lot of people who were very good at mixing as well at the DMC offices. <laughs> uh, you know, Chad Jackson was the, uh, there was the world mixing champion when yeah. I went down there. I actually shared a house with him when I moved <laughs> when I moved down. So I was getting, you know, I was in good hands then. If you're talking about mentors a bit further down the line, once yeah. I got to DMC, then yes, um, was a lot of people uh, that I learned a lot from. So yeah, so this was all 1989, 1990, 91. I was at, I was working at Mixmag. I was started the Brothers in Rhythm. I started mm-hmm. DJing in nightclubs again, and it all kind of all all aspects of what I was doing was take were taking off. Wow. So it got to the point where I couldn't actually manage all of them, um, mm-hmm. and and. After about three years of being editor of Mixmag, I realised that I preferred the actual DJing side of it and the and the production side of it, mm-hmm. and the writing, um, you know, was something, and and running the magazine was something that people who were better qualified, who had better experience and and um, qualifications to do it, <laughs> probably was a good time for them to take over and yeah. take Mixmag onto the next level. Which Dom Dom Phillips and, and David Davis were the two people that that uh, myself and Nick Gordon Brown who was my assistant editor, we, mm-hmm. we got Dom and David to come and take over from us. And and Nick and I went on to start Stress Records. <laughs> <laughs> so we kind of swapped, um, swapped running the magazine for starting a record label. So I then, yeah, then it was DJ in production and running a record label, which kind of has, has been my three different um, sides to my, strings to my bow ever yeah. since, really. Yeah. 30 years. That's nuts. And yeah, like you say, it's all going on at that time. I mean, I do want to dive in a little bit into Shelley's, um, if I may, because, you know, we've spoken to loads of DJs on this podcast and, you know, the name that always comes up is the Hacienda or whatever, you know, and that's the one that kind of everyone's super familiar with. And sometimes you mention Shelley's and it's, you know, it's not necessarily talked about as as much, but it's obviously as important as, as Hacienda. And like you said, when that when that club closed for a bit, or yep. everyone needed somewhere else to go. And it's almost that equidistance between Manchester and Birmingham that kind of gave it a bit mm. of a different vibe and a different crowd. Can you just take us through like what a Shelley's type of night was and what kind of music was being played there? And, you know, that cult feeling around, you know, yourself being there and Sasha being there as well. What, what was it? What was it all like? It's very difficult to explain how how exciting it was 
to you know everybody was living for that friday night you know mm -hmm. they all week waiting for for that just to get into that club and it really was as soon as those doors opened people ran into the club and ran straight on the dance floor they didn't go and like mill around the the bar and and wait for people to arrive and you know about an hour and a half later a few people might go on and people ran onto the dance floor from from the from the minute and it was full within half an hour because yeah. people have been queuing um for an hour an hour and a half before the doors opened to literally get in and run straight in because it was only it only, only ran from 10 to 2 2am 2, 2 was the, the finishing time back then mm -hmm. uh, which was why part of the reason why all these raves were going on because people wanted to be out all night and nightclubs were licensed until 2 o'clock so yeah. so yeah it was very intense I mean you know uh, Ecstasy was playing a big part in, in, in that whole revolution of the whole loved up feel the social landscape of the uk changed dramatically through these years you know if um if i i was i'm from leeds so if i was if we um, went to manchester pre pre acid house mm -hmm. um in 1985 and went to a nightclub this was football hooliganism kind of territory you know there was it was tribal it was yeah. territory driven you know if i open my mouth with a yorkshire accent in another city not manchester any other city in the uk there'd be people you know out on friday on a friday or saturday night just looking for a fight that's what yeah. they did you know and, and it was so when ecstasy arrived and dance music arrived in 88 that was just wiped out over one summer and all of a sudden people were traveling all over the country and being welcomed everybody loved each other and that, of course that was a lot driven by the by the by the drug of course um but that that went on um you know and and really changed how people were re um, receptive to, to to people's uh, uh sexuality and race mm -hmm. and and it really broke down so many barriers um and the music was euphoric you know so people were going out to to really have an amazing time uh shelley's particularly was driven by italian piano house mm -hmm. so there was lots of amazing euphoric drops and there's no phones there's no distractions it was and 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 you know uh, ecstasy as a drug was all about being it's a communal drug it's about people all being together and celebrating life and having having a great time and feeling great and loving each other and so that that all that boiled into one intense little period every friday night and saturday <laughs> night and, and any other night of the week if anybody could get it <laughs> um it was super super life-changing as i say the whole fab the whole social fabric landscape of the uk changed over yeah. over one summer and took by the by the end of the 80s i mean everybody was the way people had more respect for each other and uh, and and were more accepting and open and and tolerant and and everything was was um it's hard to kind of say how how, how, how transformative it was at those times and, and Shelley's was right you know right there and you know people were just were out to have the best time of their lives and that's why everybody looks looks back on it to people talk about Shelley's or Hacienda they talk <laughs> about those times because it was the most amazing of times you know yeah. uh and it was it was new it was fresh it was it was you know it's like something that you never experienced before I think that's that's key as well now people mm -hmm. take for granted everybody going together and you know all jumping up and down to, to a breakdown on a, a festival or whatever that, that that didn't really happen for pre this this time was when it all changed yeah you're completely right and you know you mentioned how the music there was fueled by you know a real kind of communal happy uh, piano driven kind of sound and obviously you were behind some of that with with brothers in rhythm and such a good feeling and, and those kind of records as well when you were making those were you making those with that kind of dance floor in mind uh, like oh I'll, i want to make a track i can play in a certain environment or was it just a case of yeah. this is this is what's prevalent right now and i feel like i should jump on it no they were the, both those records were a lot most of the records i made early early with steve as brothers in rhythm um, were all made for specific dance floors mm. uh, peace and harmony was made for the hacienda dance floor mm -hmm. such a good feeling was made for um the shelley's dance floor the mighty ming was made for the renaissance venue 44 dance floor they were all yeah. specifically you know make targeted to one particular nightclub back then yeah cool i mean yeah and you mentioned renaissance there i want to kind of talk about that i mean you've got a really long association with that brand i mean it's a huge huge brand a real mark of quality in the scene and and it kind of marked a bit of difference in terms of a different almost approach i don't want to say high-end or glamorous because that sounds makes it sound like it's exclusive 
um, and not as inclusive, but it had a different level of kind of feeling and production and the artwork and all of those things together. I mean, can you give us some background on how you got involved with, with Renaissance? Uh, well, Jeff, who, who owns Renaissance, was uh, he used to go to Shelley's. So I used to know him from being on the dance floor at Shelley's. <laughs> and then when uh, when Shelley's kind of sort of tailed off a little bit um, towards the end of 91, you know, like anything, I suppose, you know, it became everybody knew it, got to know about it. And then you got all sorts of elements of people that weren't necessarily there really for the right reasons for the music. Music or mm-hmm. you know um, um uh, yeah sasha you know got a bit disillusioned with it and, and 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 me quite soon afterwards and so yeah jeff wanted to start a new place that i'd we went back to where um you know pe- people who were really into it from the beginning who were really there for the music could just a new home for, for that really and so started was a little it was a little bit more exclusive um you know you had to you had to make a bit of an effort to get mm-hmm. a little bit more dressed up. There was certainly production values, right? And that's one thing that Renaissance really brought to the table and still do to this day. You know, the the um, the production was wasn't some sort of sweaty rave pit anymore. It was a bit more uh, a bit more glamorous. People wanted to get dressed up a little bit. Yeah, it was just the next logical pro- progression. Really, it was mm-hmm. taking uh, being a bit more artistic with it, um, taking it to the next level. Mm-hmm. Uh, and of course now some of the production that you get in some some uh, some of the festivals and but that was the start of it that was taking it out of out of the very basic in being in a fields and in, in, uh, in a, in a, in basic nightclubs uh, and and trying to take it to a to a um to a next next level really yeah yeah and and that really became the home of what no what became known as kind of progressive house and that kind of sound um, and you mentioned Venue 44 and obviously Renaissance existed in numerous places kind of across the country over different eras. For me, I went to uni in Nottingham and I was there in from 98 to 2002. So for me, when it when Renaissance opened in media in 99, that was just completely mind blowing. And, you know, I was there every weekend. I used to love that place. I mm. mean, f- for you, having played at those different eras in different places in different cities, what for you defines the peak renaissance what what is the one that is like that is the ultimate renaissance era um well for me venue 44 i think when it first started was amazing in mansfield mm-hmm. it really was uh, cherish cherish some of those nights but yeah i mean it did continue right through to like you say media was amazing the cross around uh, yeah. sort of the end of end of the 90s early 2000s is when renaissance were at the cross regularly in london and then and then media in nottingham and all those stately home parties that they did as well around that time were was was amazing times as well and i did some crazy tours with them as well around the world uh, australia and asia and stuff around then as well so that was a that was definitely an um uh, a memorable amazing period that i look back on with, with with real fondness as well they're kind of seen as the brand that introduced the mix album obviously with the mix collection volume one sasha and digweed and whatever and you've done i think is it 10 renaissance mix albums over the years um yeah done quite a few <laughs> yeah i mean that as a format really was was kind of back back before those things came out it was just a compilation album you know like now that's what i call music number 24 or whatever would be the thing that people would buy or or like a dance music hits album there there wasn't necessarily anything available where you could um listen to what a dj would be doing in a in a in a club i mean you put it commercially available no but i mean there was but yeah it was was like tapes yeah yes yeah exactly and um you know so when you are approaching those mixes or any mix album obviously you've done four for global underground as well which is another huge brand when you're approaching those and creating those what 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 do you want to achieve is it different from creating a track or an album you know what are you trying to put together with those well that the mix the mix album changed over the years actually actually pre-renaissance i uh, myself and carl cox did the very first uh commercially available dj mix compilation uh, back in 1991 i believe mix mag live where uh, volume one was the first one oh, um, no way. so and journeys by djs they mm-hmm. kind of did a, a series as well um and the, but yeah renaissance uh was 93 was it 92 93 yeah. something like that i mm-hmm. think that they they did the mix collection uh stress were uh, records we were doing dj culture with i did a mix uh, with sasha um, um a mix cd so yeah i mean they were DJ mixes at the time were, were very much driven by by bootleg cassettes. Mm. DJs were recording their sets all the way through that Acid House period of 88, 89. And those cassettes were circulating. And that's how people got to hear them. And then obviously once 
DMC was, the, as I say, Mixed Mag Live was one of the first ones because DMC had a, a had a good relationship with PRS, with the P, uh, PPL and, and all of the authorities, the record industry authorities, to be able to license tracks and yeah. make that kind of thing happen. And then, of course, yeah, Renaissance came, Session D, we did Mix Collection, and then the Ministry of Sound started and, and Global Underground, who were doing illegal cassettes before that but then the real everybody realized that this could be done as a as a you know you could actually license these tracks properly Mm -hmm. and put them out and people would lap them up and they would sell in their thousands which they did so um so yeah so when when you're when you were approaching them it kind of those early ones were very much just a live a live mix really um just trying to get it out properly available in the shop so the artists would get paid and um you know everybody rather than it just be a, a dodgy out the back of a at the back of a car boot, <laughs> um, a load of bootlegs. Um, so that was the that was the initial thing. But then, obviously, as technology developed, um, you realised that you could do a lot more than you know. Mixing wasn't just a turn ta- two turntables and a mixer. You could go into a computer and you could start layering lots of different things over the top, and you could do edits and change things around. And so you could, rather than it being like one record led in, into the next one, you could start having like layer upon layer and it could become like this really quite creative Mm -hmm. audio collage real piece of art um the idea of mixing became something way 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 more than just you know going from one record to the next um and and that's that's where you know those global underground uh, albums and the the later renaissance albums um yeah started to to take take uh, mixed compilations onto another level it became it's like a a jigsaw puzzle really you know you find Mm. all these these various pieces and you you find a way to kind of put them all together to make this this whole which is much greater than the sum of its parts Mm. um uh, and that's a a labor of love that can uh, you know spend weeks and weeks on some of these things not just rock up and set the turntables up and set rec- record and, and that was it that's you know if you want to see a, i always said if you want to go see, uh, see a dj live or if you want to go see a band live go see them live you know go mm-hmm. see them do that but then you wouldn't expect a, a band to to only put out a live set as their album they'll go in the studio and they'll create this amazing you know get, get creative and 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 create this this thing that they can do because they're in a studio and it's the same for djs really you, you can do so much more um be so much more creative um and then and then go out and play live as well it's two separate things yeah, um, yeah. so yeah that's where the compilations uh, became what they what they uh, what they turned into yeah and i mean i always did enjoy like seeing just the track list on them and just being um educated in a way that you know it wasn't just four to the floor like you know 125 bpm or whatever it was you know some decent left field choices that were down tempo you know there's a track actually that you've chosen for one of your your five tracks i won't say which one it is now but i discovered from one of your mix collections and it's this beautiful piece of music and it's just like you know that sense of discovery as well where it's you know you go see a dj play and it's you know what you're going to get like a live experience like you say but getting a mix album you feel like they've put you know really brought a lot more to bear on it in terms of taste yeah it allows you to be uh a little bit more creative um than you would you know than you're than you're able to do in a live environment obviously again as technology's changed now you can do a lot of these things live as well you can really read <laughs> remix and layer and loop and do stuff like back then you couldn't really do that you know yeah. this is pre this is pre digital when we're yeah. talking you know i mean there were cd players but they were very very basic you couldn't loop things up really back then no. <laughs> and and do layers upon layers i mean you know again we talked it, it, it was some of those early mix compilations that i did i was still mixing them on turntables but i was mixing them in segments and then and then editing them together and then putting them and then going to the studio and doing overdubs over the top of them so um again it was as technologies developed you know obviously things things have you've been allowed to do more and more and more yeah totally and you know you're talking about technology and what you can do in that live environment you've obviously seen it go from and we've talked about belt drive turntables to techniques to to cdjs to digital to you know you don't necessarily even need to have any kind of you just rock up with a laptop and a you know a a mixer and off you go Uh, where where did you stand on that crossover point where it went from vinyl to digital and um you know obviously there are massive benefits there in terms of you're not having to lug like heavy record cases around and whatever and just 
you know, but then, you know, people were technically sometimes a bit snooty about about it. Where How did that exist and grow with you, that digital kind of crossover during that time? DJ 1000 was when it when the, the when it was all flipped on its head when pioneer brought out the cdj 1000 yeah because mm-hmm. that really you know you could you could it was the simulation with the with the with the uh with the platter there as you know you could scratch a cd <laughs> backwards and forwards and spin it back and that was when everything changed really yeah. um uh, prior to that um you know you could make there were you know people there was obviously um cdjs before that um and Denon's and you know CDJ 500s, I think that was before that, wasn't it? Um, but they weren't. It wasn't the same as vinyl. You couldn't do the same same things. So once they once they came up with a machine that really simulated vinyl, mm-hmm. um, then it, then it became something different. And then of course, um, you know, with that's when you yeah you said you didn't have to suddenly carry all the vinyl around, which was really heavy and really cumbersome and and um, and you could also record, you know, you could be making music and people, could, you could get something on a CD like that mm-hmm. from, you could be in the studio and burn a CD and take it out and play with you that night. Couldn't do that with vinyl. You know, vinyl <laughs> took weeks to, to, uh, to, to be able to get it pressed up. So, um, so to, have, to be able to just make something and then go play it that night, um, mm. you know, that whole convenience thing. And, and then as digital obviously progressed, you know, to be able to do your own edits and then turn up with a USB with like, you know, a month's worth of music on a chewing gum stick, you know, yeah, <laughs> rather, yeah. rather than, uh, you know, rather than carrying a hundred record boxes or equivalent or something. Um, yeah just this yeah i mean you know there's there's pros and cons of course there is you know yeah. um what also also happened with the digital era is it really devalued music you know mm-hmm. there's no value whatsoever in an mp3 really you know you can't um i can't sell on an mp3 to somebody yeah. if i bought it you know? yeah. uh but vinyl you know vinyl actually actually still holds literally doesn't you know have a value i can mm. i can sell it on to somebody it's it's it retains something so um it's physical so there's there's ups and downs of course and and you know there's back to the 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 idea of having a a collection physical collection of something is much more appealing um to me well my vinyls are over over there yeah the uh uh, (laughs) the um the ability over lockdown to be able to go through it all and and do a big sort out of my vinyl and i really felt fallen back in love with it and started buying it again as well um not necessarily to play out but you just um I don't really there's no you know folders of mp3s from 2006 that i've got in the cloud mm. I, it's not exciting to go and go trailing through a folder of mp3s in the on my computer yeah. whereas you know going through records, pulling records out and that emotional attachment there is to to a piece of vinyl and and, yeah. and the memory that it really uh, holds much more so than than all mp3s that all look the same that are all just yeah. you know just that's unfortunately the, the the downside of it, uh, but there, yeah, there was many upsides as well. Yeah, um, the ability to, to send something across the world like that um, and put it on your stick and play it that night and do your own edit of it, make your own mm-hmm. version of it there and then in your hotel room and yeah, I mean, the creative creative possibilities are endless. Yeah, like you say, and, and there's there's no um, joy or val- where well, there's no excitement going through a folder of of MP3s or whatever. And like, I struggle so much to remember the names of things but I know what color the sleeve was or what the label looked like or you know as soon as you pull that out and you see it you can hear it I can hear it in my head I see it written down on the screen it takes me ages to to remember what's what that is yeah as I say pros and real pros and cons but um yeah I'm really back in love with vinyl again at the moment I'm collecting yeah my boyhood passion of (laughs) of collecting records has been rekindled <laughs> <laughs> i think a lot of djs have seen a few collections including your some of yours as well go up for sale and i think because lockdown has just afforded people with huge collections just to go through them and rediscover that yeah. love and sometimes maybe be like oh well why have i got two of these or this one's never been played yeah. or whatever i mean w- was that a wrench to to sell some of some of that vinyl, or was it a case of it felt good to relieve yourself of this? Yeah, it was cathartic. I had, mm. I mean, I'd already got rid of thousands a few years ago, about ten years ago when we moved house. Um, I had about ten thousand, um, and they were all in boxes in the in the garage, and I'd, I'd been for ages. I hadn't really even got them out, and so yeah, it afforded me the time, you know, to 
to go through them all. And, and yeah, I had several copies of certain things. You know, what am I doing with five copies of things? Uh, boxes sometimes of some of my own stuff. What am I, what am I keeping a box of 25 of a, of a record from, you know, from 20 years ago? So, yeah, so I could... I could, yeah. Um, it was, yeah, it was really cathartic to go through it all, and lots of stuff that I, you know, records that maybe meant something back then, but didn't really mean anything anymore. Didn't stand the test of time. Mm. Falling out of love with a lot of acetates, which I didn't really need anymore. But to some people, they're real collectors' items, mm-hmm. real, real genuine collectors, because they are properly one-offs. And yeah, just yeah. So it was a case of going through, and I wanted every. I wanted to get my my ten thousand. I had about, and I've got. I've probably got down to about six now. Probably you know offloaded about four thousand of the stuff that I didn't need anymore, and I, I needed a bit more space to start filling up. <laughs> 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 um, so, uh, um, yeah. So one man's you know I, I, one man's trash is another man's treasure kind mm. of thing, and you find a new home for it. And and um, yeah, it was it was a it was a, a project that um, that was something that. Came me going through uh, a really enjoyable cathartic process Kept yeah. going through, through, through lockdown yeah no way and i mean was there is there a temptation that you've rediscovered some stuff that might be you know 10 15 years old that you're like actually i'm going to start playing this out again i really enjoy this and and, and yeah. playing off vinyl as well again is that uh, is that going to be a thing um uh yeah the, both of those things i have taken digital copies of quite a few things so i've got mm-hmm. them now um playing vinyl i'm not going to go out and t- take vinyl around the world anymore but i probably will i mean i have been buying a lot this of new stuff again uh, I probably will do maybe a vinyl stream at the end of the year, maybe mm-hmm. like a year end best of this year stuff on vinyl. Mm-hmm. Um, there's been, yeah, lots of um, ideas and things being stimulated from going through old records and finding old samples and, and oh yeah, this sounds amazing still. And, and you know, it's, oh, maybe, I, maybe I should make something along these lines, take an inspiration from, um, so yeah, I mean it's a it's a it's a wall of inspiration now at mm. least for me that everything on the uh, on the shelf is means something, takes me back to a particular era, um, you know, generates stimulates uh, you know some some creativity, inspiration. Yes, yeah, um, and not only that, it's like it's an art, it's an archive. You know, I've got books on there as well, and I'm gonna sort some CDs out over there and, and DVDs and and everything. It's gonna be a wall of of you know everything that i've loved over <laughs> over uh, my um my you know collect, collecting art and, and and music and culture and stuff so um so yeah that's it's it's uh I, it, it, that is one of the, the best things that came out of lockdown for yeah. me for sure yeah it's that is and it's that ongoing project i think that any dj or any music lover has that you know that add tweak refine you know get rid of and just keep building shaping um yeah. Yeah, ended, yeah. Ex- exactly. And I mean, uh, in terms of you've you've mentioned as well about record labels and what you've been doing amongst there. Obviously, you've mentioned stress as audio therapy and there's your new project, late well, latest project, Celador. Um, I mean, you know, obviously across all three of those, you've had some brilliant releases, iconic tracks. You work with legends. Um, you know, what what are you trying to achieve when you're running a label and what you're on the lookout for in terms of artists and sound and, and you know, what you're just trying to create in that pocket that you own? Um, well, just music that excites us, really, uh, whatever that might be. Um, uh, three very different eras again there, you know, between <laughs> of the, of the three, three different labels. But currently uh, we sell a door, which is the label I run with Steve Parry, and mm-hmm. we're, we're, we're nine years into that, up to our... 150th release already 150 releases wow nice. um yeah i mean you're always always uh, as a dj you're always on the hunt for new music get sent a lot of of, of demos obviously i have a lot of relationships with a lot of producers and, and people i've known for years that's constantly sending us stuff and uh, as a label owner you want to you know present you know if somebody gives you a piece of music um to to, to release then you want to present that in the best possible way you can really mm-hmm. so and there's so much to do now um in terms of you know it, it was a bit simpler back in the in the day i think when it was vinyl um but with so many different platforms and so many different ways to market things and uh so many social media uh, channels and and um yeah there's so many so many uh, uh boxes to tick now mm-hmm. uh every release is a is a real mission a real campaign to try and try and, and obviously there's, there's, as well there's so much music out there to yeah. try and get heard yeah. try and get seen try and get heard is is another um another challenge every time you put something out so so we're just looking for music that that i mean the, the real basic um criteria for for getting something on cellar is something that me and steve both love both of us have to love it one can't love it and the other one's not quite so sure we both <laughs> have to really love it so we can really put our full 
full force behind it and then try and present it and try to do the best job to to get that get that out there for, to, to do the best by the artist mm -hmm. and at the same time for the label to you know to keep growing the label as, as a as a as a home that people trust um yeah. you know for, for the kind of music that we put out we, we, hopefully that you know they think yeah if you're a fan of, of what we do yeah we'll you almost buy buy a cellar door release without even having to listen to it because you you kind of trust trust what we we do and and, and that's the that's the ultimate that's the mm. the um the holy grail i suppose that, that you get a, a, enough of a community to love what you do and 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 obviously you can take that into into branding and doing gigs and merchandise and everything else that goes with running a a gang um you know a, a community so um and it, it and it's a again it's another addictive thing it's a yeah. process that you just, you're always looking for the next thing always the the next release and and um yeah it's a lot of work goes into running a label now people don't realize i mean it's always been always been a lot of work going into it but so much more so now than ever before yeah yeah and uh, another kind of stage that's happened in the past i'm talking about 3d and you it's almost like that super group um like the traveling wilburys of uh of, of progressive house it's just brilliant you know they you know dave seem and danny house you know, and i love that one the traveling wilburys of progressive house <laughs> we we're going to use that as a tagline on all the flyers from that one. <laughs> there you go you can have that um yeah you, yourself danny house and darren emerson i mean obviously you're probably you know been friends on the circuit for years and whatever what was how did that come together was it always something you talked about doing and it just happened and how do you guys operate as a threesome how do you opposite operate behind the decks and is it a free-for-all yeah no it was it was just by accident we all got booked to play the ministry of sound on the same night and um i judge after a few drinks with the promoter of the time i'd say oh we should call it 3d dave danny and darren um <laughs> after a few drinks and the next thing i knew he'd made a fly that said 3d on it um and um and then we did the gig and then on the monday after after that uh, we started getting phone calls asking if people could book 3d as if it was suddenly a thing and it was all just a yeah happy accident really of course we had a great night together because we all known each other for years mm -hmm. we all come from a similar similar era similar background the, the you know got the gu albums all behind us um mm -hmm. you know so um and it was it just became a thing so we start uh, we we realized that actually doing a tour of south america together or wherever was or america together was a, a fun thing to do rather than traveling on your own we could all carry on with our individual careers but it, it was a, like another string to our our bow um and you know three of us together is you know greater than the sum of our parts for, yeah. for a festival or whatever they can put all three of us together and it was a something new give give a bit of fresh impetus to what we were doing and it was mm -hmm. a challenge i think that was the thing as well because all you know three of us all have our own individual styles really even though we come from a a, a similar similar background um so to try and knit that together in a in a in a coherent cohesive set was uh, something that was a bit of a challenge. And after thirty yeah. plus years of DJing, a, a new challenge is a, is a good thing to uh, to to have. So um, so yeah, and, and that's an ongoing thing. Obviously, lockdowns kind of stopped us getting together and doing so much stuff. We just usually play a couple of tracks each, uh, and then maybe a track each as as the night develops. Yeah, uh, yeah. And kind of weave weave our own sort of little. Nuance, nuances into uh, into a into a, a patchwork of uh, of travel traveling Wilbury's quilt. <laughs> <laughs> and is there any kind of hijinks behind the decks? Is you know, is someone trying to put the other one off, or are you strictly professional one hundred percent of the time? What's kind of happening there? Oh well, obviously it's important that we still we still retain a a, a degree of of uh, professionalism, <laughs> but but we do have fun, and I think that's I think that's. Um, plain for, for people to see and I think that can be infectious I think you know if you go see a DJ and you see that they're actually having fun I think that that kind of transmits itself to the dance floor as well so um so yeah I think it's important to to um to show that absolutely okay so yeah to wrap this up um that we'll come on to the perfect playlist so the house culture perfect playlist it's on spotify it's existed since the very first episode of the podcast and every single one of our guests has submitted five tunes based on one of the five themes that we have and you know it's a huge beast it's you know nearly a nearly a day long, over a day long i think now um and there's some incredible selection of tunes on there some really really huge anthems some things that you might not have heard of and some things from left field and especially with some of the themes that we've 
cover you know some things that aren't necessarily even dance music either so you know, it's a real kind of discover place to discover music and you've been really good and you've given me the choices up front they're all fantastic choices um and if we could just go through each one individually and just get a little bit of like your experience with that track maybe the first time you heard it or why you love it and you know what like, what special place does that have for you so we always start off with <clears throat> excuse me, we always start off with The Catalyst, so a track that first kind of got you into dance music or electronic music, and you have chosen... Herbie Hancock, Rocket. Um, I, I was going to say New Order, Blue Monday, because New Order, uh, these, they both came out roughly the same time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, I mean, everybody knows Blue Monday. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, same, similar era. Um, yeah, Blue Monday was one, one of the first... I'm, I, I kind of... Um, when you when you talk about things that got me into dance music, well, there was a mm-hmm. lot of records pre nineteen eighty three, which is the year we're talking about, that mm-hmm. was were dance music. But I never really saw them as dance music. They were just pop records that were you know they were dance records that were in the pop charts really. You know, so all the disco stuff and um, you know and, and um, Blue Monday would have been like um, one of the first real electronic club records. It only came out as a twelve inch. You mm-hmm. know, it was and Arthur Baker produced and it really got me into club music as well but the same year but as i say that's quite obvious so the same year um also another record that really grabbed my attention and i really realized that it was it was a real record that was really different and really turned me on to lots of things um was was herbie hancock's rocket um mm-hmm. it was it was um, a record from outer space it really was all the scratching that was going on on it um it was just as I became aware of breakdancing, which I got heavily into around about that time. <laughs> started break um, and it really, yeah. So the whole New York culture of the time it was a combination of those two records, actually, because because obviously Arthur Baker did did Blue Monday. Um, mm-hmm. So he was making Booker's Revenge around that time and all that New York club culture at the same time. Uh, you know, New York was the epicenter of breakdancing. And, and, and you know, um, so Herbie Hancock's Rocket was um, was was something that was just like wow what what is that uh, i need yeah. i need more of that i need to know more about that and and um um yeah to this day it's still a, an amazing amazing record uh, nearly yeah. 40 years old both of them that is, <laughs> that is that is crazy to think about that it, it's, i think is it the first record to feature like scratching on it or something like that as well and just to yeah hearing well, that there sound might have been a yeah, there might have been a couple um, of, of rap records before that that were, you know, that were, had some scratching on them. Um, but yeah, we're certainly one of the main ones that, that actually crossed over and became a yeah. became a, a, a worldwide hit. Yeah, yeah. And um, so we move on to the next one, which is a floor filler. And you've been, um, this is quite interesting, actually, because a lot of people sometimes, if they're an artist or a DJ, do sometimes pick a track by themselves. So um, what have you shame. chosen? <laughs> Shameless self promotion, mate. What are we in this for? If I'm not going to shout about it, I can't rely on everybody else to shout out about it. <laughs> Wise words. And, and and to be honest, um, to be honest, yeah. When you say uh, floor filler, well, I mean, obviously, I could cho- choose lots of different things, but um, I wanted to choose something current. And uh, mm. and and when I'm making records in in um, you know in the studio, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to make a record that's going to fill the floor. That's going to be one of the yeah. peak records in my sets. So yeah, so I cho- chose one of my own. Yeah, mm-hmm. you don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's gonna it's um, gonna go straight in there. Yeah. It's great. Uh, yeah, so this was one that uh, a track that I put out earlier this year called Buzz mm-hmm. Puzzle, um, mm-hmm. which was uh, a record which was made through lockdown. Um, I actually started it before before lockdown, and then through through various. Um, um, sessions uh, uh i was with 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 somebody else a guy that worked in the studio with called jay gilbert so we, we did a few remote sessions to kind of finish it off and, and put it out in january and i'm really really pleased with it and and, and it was funny because talking about floor filling of course it came out when there wasn't any floors to fill <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so um yeah. so, so it was i would and and then when i started djing again i'd almost forgotten about it because um you know we were on to the next lot of you know six months after yeah. i'd made it so and it was somebody else that came up and asked us asked it asked for it i requested it and and um i was like oh god i haven't even played that out to a, a dance floor and i did play it at our our recent cellador celladoria night we have we've started at some new night label nights called under the banner celladoria which we had, a, had our first one in london at e1 and, and it, it was one of the biggest records of the night i was really really pleased so yeah so there you go floor filler 
Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and it works as well. That's incredible. Yeah, that's awesome. And uh, okay, so next uh, next one is the Sunsetter. Uh, perfect track to soundtrack a sunset. Yeah. Um, so going back of back uh, to to 1989, I think summer of 89 um, was the summer of love around about that. Time. Um, uh, yeah, the Cure lullaby. Mm. Um, uh, is a record that I still associate with long, lazy, sunny afternoons and sunsets. It's just an amazing Balearic treasure, a real mm. gem of a record that obviously doesn't really come from um, electronic music culture, but um, really does fit in with that Balearic kind of feel of that of what was going on on that summer and, um, mm. and still sounds amazing to this day. Um, yeah, I love, love that record. Um, yeah. So yeah, The Cure, Lullaby. Yeah, there's so much going on in that. It's got a real, real mood to it. It's, it's awesome. Um, okay, and this is the one that I kind of alluded to earlier. My my wife, bless her, she's going to love this as well because this is uh, the tearjerker. Mine too. <laughs> it's such a beautiful track. Um, what have you chosen? And just tell me a bit more about it. Uh, I chose uh, Gorechi by, by Lam. Um so uh yeah i mean as you mentioned before i've had it i actually had it on a couple of uh, uh compilations um back in the in the 90s um and, and yeah an, an amazing amazing record one of the best records ever made for me i, I def- definitely have it in my top 10 of all time and yeah i mean my wife will love it as well because we had it played at our wedding <laughs> <laughs> one of the great well, one of the best love songs ever ever written in, uh, you know it's very difficult to to write a love song uh, without being cliched um, with so many, so many hundreds of thousands of records being, mean, being, you know, being written about love, but they did it in a in a really fresh, beautiful way, and and those opening chords and stuff are, are spine tingling and and very emotional to this day. I mean, yeah, as I say, we had it we had it played at our wedding when we were signing the register, so um, so it always brings back um, some some great emotions. Yeah, it's stunning. And even like, I think when we went to the cinema years ago, my wife and I saw Moulin Rouge and it's in that and just out of nowhere, Nicole Kidman starts singing it. And it was like, you know, the, the, I get the arm grab from my missus like, wow, this is, yeah, it's such a beautiful piece of music. Yeah, it's always, always hairs, hairs on the back of your neck, that one for sure. Yeah, I've literally just felt them just now. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Okay, and uh, so a last tune. Um, it's the end of the night. Crowd are asking for one more. What do you play? Yeah, I thought I'd do something current again because uh, we had a, had a few oldies in, in amongst those ones. So uh, one of the best records I think made this year for me was uh, something that came out over the summer and actually beautiful, beautiful um, remix by Sebastian Leger of Cyberpunks uh, on Renaissance. And again, somebody else we mentioned a lot of from Renaissance <laughs> records uh, featuring. Um, uh, uh, coaching yeah uh, Sean mm-hmm. Evans um, so uh, yeah amazing amazing record called Aliens beautiful beautiful end of the night moment perfect and so this is the last question um, we always ask our guests um, we are house culture and obviously you've you're part of the culture of the scene you've been in it for 30 years you've done it all you you know and you're still doing it which is fantastic you know a real kind of you know this whole conversation has been so much knowledge and passion and everything within that when you look back on what you've achieved so far and your place within the culture of the scene and then you look at your life alongside that what has dance music brought to you as a whole well it's 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 been the soundtrack to my life obviously um and it's been my it's been my my career you know it's been my my passion and my career rolled into one which is uh, i was a you know something i try and tell my boys if you can find something that you love really love and you can make a career out of it then you never have to work a day in your life really um so um not quite that's quite it's quite like that in reality <laughs> there's a lot of work goes into it but, but yeah i mean it's you know um to do to, to do something um that you really enjoy uh, makes it a lot easier to get up every morning and, and um it's been everything really from 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 word go obviously my, my family and um, along, alongside that, is uh, but oh, that whole thing together has has has, uh, has been everything. I mean, what well, you know, as 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 as, as my, my my passion, my career, my, my my love from from a very early early age, something that I, I can can see myself doing until 
till the, you know the day I drop. Um, I don't see any reason to hang my headphones up. <laughs> I've got no intention of doing so. So um, um, yeah, music is is the uh, is the healing force, isn't it? It's the it's the, um, the the language that we all speak, no matter where we come from, and and um, and can bring everybody together and do so much, make do so much. So um, so yeah, it will, it will always be the, one of the the main things that in, in my life for sure. Perfect. That's a great final thought to end on. That's 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 brilliant. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. So soon. See ya. House culture. That was brilliant, wasn't it? Not only do I feel like I've learned all about Dave's career, but I've also been given a thorough education on the birth of house music in the UK, told by a genuine expert. I want to say a huge thanks to Dave for sitting down with us for that chat. Much appreciated. You also heard Dave choose some incredible tracks for our House Culture Perfect playlist, which you can find over on Spotify. Just search that up. You'll be able to listen to the submissions from all of our previous podcast guests. Just stick it on shuffle, turn it up loud. You will not be disappointed. Then once you vibe into that stellar selection, please don't forget to do all of that good stuff for us. I'm talking loving, liking, tweeting, sharing, telling your friends or leaving us a review. We love to hear your feedback and if you have some nice things to say, we'll make sure you give you a shout out on a future episode. And then if you don't follow us already, come and join our party over on our Instagram feed at HouseCultureNet or by following the hashtag TrueHouseCulture. We're all about the positivity and the fun stuff that this musical movement can bring, so don't be a stranger. Come on over and say hi. And finally, if you want to get in touch with me, Matt Rouse, you can do that directly on Instagram at DJ Matt Rouse. Thanks for listening. Rave safe and see you next time. House Culture.